morning. So let's continue our discussion from where we left in the previous class, and we started looking at the people optimization. And as I described in the towards end of the previous class, what we are trying to do here is we have sliding window which moves over the code, and whenever you find, and the sliding window is normally of size two to four, and this result has been obtained empirically that uh, window size of two to four is sufficient, and whenever you find a shorter code sequence for the same operation, and then you try to replace it. You see, you have designed various samples. And this technique was developed sometime in the first actually paper appeared sometime in the 80s, and then it has been continuously improved. And people went on to do work like saying, why just have a physical window, why not have a logical window? For example, if you will have a branch instruction, then the actual jump to then or else may be physically part separated. And I mean, why can't you have a window which will have two instructions of branch just prior to branch, and the next instruction in the window could be of the part where the control will actually jump. Okay, so branch prediction also can be done using that. Okay. So basically, what we are doing here is that we are looking at the target code which contains all the redundancies and the suboptimal constructs, and we want to replace them by a shorter sequence of target instruction, and that is what the keyhole is, and replace it by a faster sequence, and this is a Small moving <coughs> to the target system. Okay, so let's look at what we're trying to do here. Okay. So, what we have is, for example, this is the first example we saw. That suppose I have this template which says remove redundant loads and stores, and you see this template, then instruction two, we know that irrespective of what the application is, this can always be removed unless you have an explicit jump coming to the second instruction. In that case, if you remove it, it could be dangerous. So instruction two can always be removed if it does not have a label. Okay. So this is one optimization that is possible. Okay. Let's look at yet another example. Uh, today colors are so bright, at least everything is visible here. Okay. So suppose we have this code sequence, okay, and what we are dealing with is unreachable code. Okay. So suppose I have this hash defined debug uh, being initialized to zero, and then I have this loop uh, this conditional which says if debug and then print debugging information. Okay. And you have already seen this kind of code. There is one that and people very frequently use it in their application. But if you recall we discussed at some point of time that when you have lax in the application, they internally define some kind of debug switches and you can turn them on and off by just editing y dot type dot c or lax dot y or y dot c and change this from 0 to 1 and then it gives you complete information how it is going to a finite state machine or how the parser is going to a stack and gives you the complete stack information while parsing. So suppose I get into a situation like this and I know that this debug is switch. Okay. Now what, what can be done here is something very interesting. Okay. Now this says that if debug, okay, what it actually means is something when it gets translated into three at this code, maybe something like if debug is 1, then I jump to L1 where I am printing all the debugging information. Otherwise, I am going to L2. And L2 is the normal execution sequence. And I can eliminate this jump over jump because there is a jump from here to here and here to here. I can remove it by changing this condition and then code may look something like if debug is not equal to 1, then I straight away go to L2. Otherwise, I print this information. Okay. So this is how my three address code may look like. Now if I try to optimize it using the people optimization, what may happen is that I may do something called a constant propagation. Okay. A constant propagation says, okay, uh, we won't have time, into, uh, time to go into formal details of how the constant propagation is done, but what it means is that if I have a variable whose value is known at compile time and the value is constant, then I can replace the variable by the value itself and then the, after this propagation I have a condition like will say that if 0 is not equal to 1, then go to L2. Now I know that this Boolean expression can be evaluated at compile time and we know that this condition will always be, condition will always be 0 not equal to 1 is false, 0 not equal to 1 will always be true. Don't be so condition that whenever you see a Boolean condition you say true or false and look at the Boolean expression. So this condition will always be true and therefore I can replace the whole thing by saying just go to L2, okay? because that condition itself is not required. And once I say I have this jump, okay, 
all this elimination can get eliminated and even this go to can get eliminated by just the moving window. Okay, so then I can say that this code will never get executed, so print statement is now inaccessible and therefore the code becomes just a jump to L2. Okay, because I may be jumping to L2 from <coughs> many other places. Okay, but definitely this jump is redundant, okay, because from here I am just jumping, if I eliminate this will just fall through. Okay, so this is one optimization. So there are many such templates which are possible. Okay. So I can have flow of control where I say that I am having a sequence of jumps. So if I say go to L1 and L1 comes here, it says go to L2. Then I know straight away that this place can be replaced by straight away going to L2. And then this L1 going to L2, can I eliminate this? I cannot because it is possible that I am coming to L1 not only from here but from some other places. I need not replace it. So this is where I was talking about a logical window rather than just a physical key code window. Okay. And similarly, when we talk about algebraic expression, okay, I can immediately see that these kind of expressions can easily be put, put as part of the template and can be removed at the time of key code optimization. Okay. So whenever I say that I have addition with 0 or multiplication with 1, okay, I know that these are identity operations and therefore I am just going to eliminate them. They are not going to contribute anything. Similarly, I can do what we know as strength reduction because normally you will find that there are operators which will accomplish the same thing, but some operators are going to be costlier than others. Okay. So, for example, I can say that if I am trying to do find a square, exponentiation may not be an operation which is available in the hardware, and I may have to actually make a function call. But if I know that this is only a square, then I can always replace it by a multiplication. Okay. Similarly, if I say that if it is a multiplication, by a power of 2 or a division by a number which is power of 2, then I can handle that by a left shift or a right shift. Okay. So these again are templates. Okay. Similarly, <coughs> another template which may be possible is that if I say add 1 to a register, then I can replace this by an increment. Now, who designs these templates? Normally, the compiler writers who are familiar with the machine instruction set for which they are writing a compiler, they will design these templates and use them. Okay. So this is not so there is some work which says that you can also automatically generate these templates, okay. but uh, it's not always possible. There is some work which has been done on that of generating template automatically. Okay. But normally, if you design these templates and just do a pattern map, it is sufficient uh, to do the optimization. Okay. Now, another thing uh, we started looking at yesterday was when we were saying that we can either generate pre-address code, and from pre-address code, I can convert that into machine code by looking at next use information, I can do all the optimization on registers and so on. Okay. But I can also generate code by tree rewrite. Okay. And we also looked at a DAG or a tree representation of some kind of code sequence, where we did not have explicit templates. Okay. Now, what we want to do here is, if you say that I am trying to do tree rewriting, basically issue is, or the technique is something like this, that if I take a tree. Suppose this is the tree I have, okay. and I'll not go. I'll assume that recursively I can expand all the sub trees of this. If I can say that I generate some code sequence for this, or I need a template. So suppose take something like this. If I say that I'm trying to add a register to a register, okay. Suppose I have an instruction which says add to register. Okay. Now there is only a template. Depending upon actual registers, this could be, these could be any two registers from the register pool. Okay. Now suppose I find this template, then my template in the tree may look something like this, that I may have an addition and I may have some value, let's say value 1 and I will have value 2 here. Okay. So what I can do is, I can find that this template actually is something similar to this provided these value 1 and value 2 are in registers. Okay. Now, I know that there are instructions which will take value 1 and load that into a register. So, what I can do is, I can have a rewriting rule which says that if you find a template and you know that this template can be replaced by something and the corresponding action has to be executed. Now, this looks something very similar to what you actually did in React. Right? You had a template and then you said this template can be replaced by its left hand side. So, when I had a template like saying e goes to 
E of P. What I am saying here is that E of P is a template. I am replacing it by E as I am going through the process of parsing. And what was the corresponding action here? Corresponding action could be that I was either building an abstraction text tree or I was emitting some code or I was doing some application or something like that. So depending upon the application, I was able to write some action. So this looks very similar to that. It says that I have a template <coughs> which I can replace by something and at the same time I can take an action there. Okay? So suppose now I have an instruction of this form which says that I want to move content of a register into a memory location. Okay? So what this template is saying is that left hand side is an address, right hand side is a register which contains a value. This assignment is being done and the target of this is actually a memory location. Okay. So this is a template which is saying that this instruction <coughs> in general which says move contents of a register into a location whose address is given in this register can be <coughs> described by this tree kind of template. Okay. And then action could be, one of the actions could be that okay, emit this instruction whenever you find this template and replace this subtree by so I'll take an example of how this is done, okay? but this is one possibility. Okay? Now similarly I can look at other instructions. So for example, if I look at this instruction which says add a constant to a register, what this is saying is that I'm looking at a template which is saying plus constant register and then I can replace the whole template by just a register by emitting this instruction. Okay? Of course I have to do bookkeeping to say that actually which is this physical register. So R is only a template. But actual bookkeeping may, and this is what the template part is, this is what the action part is going to be, which will say emit this instruction with proper bookkeeping. Okay. Similarly, I may have another instruction where I say that add two registers and put value into a register. Okay. So I can have this template which says add R and R prime. Okay. These are two different registers and put result into R. So this is one possible template. <coughs> now what we need to do is that if I have an intermediate representation in which I am representing my code as an abstract syntax tree. Then you just need to find these templates. Okay? And how long will you go on? Okay? You can keep on finding this template till the tree reduces to a single node. And when it reduces to a single node, then you say that I am done. Because now no template can match a single node, and I can just move from that point on. Okay? So let's look at few more instructions for which I will have a template, and then let's actually look at the way we do code generation. So here is another template which says, I want to move contents of a memory location into a register. And this is saying that address of that memory location is given in the register R prime. So I can take this address, I can do dereference on that, okay, and then I can move that into contents of that into a register. So this basically is the template. This is what the replacement is. And this is the action which says that generate this instruction with proper register contents. Okay. Another possible template could be that I now say that move contents of a register into a location whose address is given by this indirect which says that the address will have to be computed by looking at contents of the register and by a small offset or some offset okay, which is a constant. Okay. Or I can say that I have a template which says take contents of a location whose address is given by R prime with an offset of D. So this D and R prime addition of that gives me an address and when I dereference that, that gives me a content of a memory location and then I am adding that to R and I am moving result into R again. Okay, so this is saying that add contents of a memory location into a register and store result into a register. Or I can have a template which says <coughs> move contents of a memory location into a register. So now I can say that look at <coughs> contents of R prime, add D to that, add the 2, that gives me an address, then I do a D reference and that takes me to R. Okay. So this is another possible template. Okay. So this way I can design template of each of these instructions. So this is yet another template which says that move, con move a constant into a register. Okay. Right. So it's, it's point clear that at least I can take machine instructions and write them in a form which looks like a tree. And once I have done this, okay, now what I can do is I can take an abstract syntax tree and I can then start doing matching of this template. And we'll see how to do this matching. Okay. So first, 
let's look at an abstract syntax tree for an expression like a is being assigned b plus c plus 9 and I have made certain assumptions here. One assumption is that they all occur in the same scope and therefore they are all of this, they are all have a location which is at an offset with respect to certain base register. Okay. Since they are in the same scope, the base register is going to be the same. So what I have assumed is that R0 is the base register and lowercase a, lowercase b and lowercase c are the offsets of the storage of a, b and c with respect to that base register. Since the scope is same, I don't have to worry about it. <coughs> and now what I need to do is, in this particular tree, so let's see what this is doing. This is saying that b plus r0 is going to give me address of b and this b reference is going to give me contents of that location. So that will give me the value of b. <coughs> this will give me the value of c. I am going to add 9 to c, then I am going to add b to c plus 9 and then I am going to store this into an address and the address is given by the left hand side which is r0 plus a and r0 is the base register. <coughs> So first, let's do a template pattern matching and then we'll see how to actually implement it. Okay. So now what are the kind of things I can do on this? Okay. Now I can match several templates and the templates I'm going to use are one of these templates. Okay. Now depending on the machine instruction you have, your templates could be different. Okay. So what we can do is we start from here and first we say is that I look at this A and this A is an offset and it matches. Now I'm doing totally arbitrary traversal order. Okay? I'm just looking at randomly some template. Okay? Traversal order has not been fixed. We'll look at how to fix the traversal order. But if I just look at this node, this says that it is matching a template which says move a constant to R. Okay? So what I can do now is I can now say that the first register I'm going to use is R1 because R0 is already blocked with an offset. And now I can generate this instruction which says move A to R1 and this node is, this D is replaced by R1 because now this constant has been moved and I have replaced this template by its left hand Okay, so I can generate this instruction and this is how my tree will do. Okay, and now again I try to do pattern match and say that now this part of the tree matches a template which says add contents of to the register. Okay. And if this part is matched, then I just have to make sure that R1 is mapped onto <coughs> R prime and R0 is mapped onto R in my generation of the instruction. So I now can say that generate an uh, instruction which says add R0 to R1. Now you know that R0 cannot be overwritten because R0 has future uses here, so I just cannot use that. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding R0 to R1, and then what do I do? I'm going to replace this particular node by saying that this gets replaced by R1. So this is how my tree looks after these two patterns. Okay. Now I can find more templates here and here is one possible template which says that I am adding two locations. Uh, I am adding this particular location into R1. So what do I do now? I just say that generate this instruction which says that there is something wrong here. It should not be add. Where is R2? There is nothing like R2 here should be actually move. So I think this is an error here. This should be a move instruction saying that I am moving contents of this into R2 and this is how it should look. I mean, I, I'll correct it. Okay. This is incorrect. And then what we can do is we can go further and we can say that, what did I do? I mean, uh, this is again a move, same, same error here. This actually should have been a move and not an error. So again, what we are doing here is that we are moving now contents of this, okay? And so I am looking at indirect R0 with C. I am adding the 2 and I am moving that into R3. Oh, oh, oh. No. There is nothing like R3 and R2 have not even been initialized. So that actually it is a move instruction, okay? Uh, please uh, note these directions. Okay? So, this then becomes R3 and this is how my tree is after this code sequence generation. Okay? And then what may happen is that I may now match another template which says now add a constant to a register R. Okay? So this constant is being added to this register. This is the template. Okay? And what may happen here is that I can now generate this instruction which says that add immediate 9 to R3. And once I do that, then this whole thing will get replaced by R3 itself. And once 
once I have done this, okay, what will happen? Now it will match maybe a template which says add two registers and store value into another target register. So basically it is now mapping uh, matching R2 and R3 and then it may generate something like add R3 <coughs> to R2 and then this whole thing gets replaced by R2. Okay. And once I have done this, okay, this is now going to match a template which says that add R prime to R indirect and this says move R2. It's totally messed up. <laughs> this, this should have been okay, an add, not a move. Okay. So now I am saying that actually this template, this is incorrect, but this move is correct okay, because I am not adding anything. I am just moving this R2 into R1 indirect. So I generate this instruction okay, and this is the instruction sequence I generate and what do I replace it with? If you replace it now, the target of this instruction is M and this whole thing gets reduced to M okay, and that is where I say that this whole thing is in memory and therefore I can stop doing any further pattern match because nothing is matched and this is the kind of code sequence I have there. Okay. But there are several issues here. Okay. One issue as I said, what is my implementation for this because we have not looked at how do I do free pattern matching and the second issue is even more dangerous. And that is when I say that I am adding two registers, you can see, so let us look at this sequence. Okay? Now the way I could have written, look at this sequence, I have register on the left hand side and a constant on the right hand side. Okay? Now this operator is commutative. Okay? That means I can also write a template which will say that constant is on the left hand side and register is on the right hand side and that will also be valid. Okay? So if I go back to the templates I had. Okay? So let us go back to this foil which where I had templates and see what we actually wrote. Okay? Uh, what we actually wrote was something like this. Okay? That I am adding a constant to a register where register was on the right hand side. And the pattern I matched was where constant is on the right hand side. So first issue you have to be immediately aware of is that if your operator is commutative then I can write the same pattern in multiple ways. That means I can write either D on the left or on the right and both are valid. Okay. Now I don't know how the user code is going to be, how user has written the code. User can write A is assigned B plus 9 or user can write A is assigned 9 plus B and both are correct. Okay. And I should be able to generate an efficient code or the same code for <coughs> both the instructions. It should not really matter in which way user has written and therefore I should make sure <coughs> that when I have an instruction like this, I also either have a template which matches plus RD or I have a way of saying this is an operator which is commutative and therefore both should match. Right? And now if you look at these templates, okay, it becomes worse because now the number of combinations you can generate from this particular instruction are, <coughs> so I can take, I can swap on this and I can swap on this. Okay? Both are possible. Okay? So you can see that from each instruction I can generate multiple templates. Okay? But then there are ways of Handling how do I match multiple templates, I can always look at all possible combinations and see if one of the template matches. Okay? And if it, your instruction tree is not too large, then that match is not going to take too much of time. Okay? But the question remains how do I implement it? Okay, so are you aware of some free pattern match algorithms? something like free pattern matching. Have you seen any free pattern matching algorithm so far? None? What is YAC? Does YAC do a free pattern match? Suppose I do now a <coughs> traversal of this pattern, a free order traversal or in order traversal and just flatten it, write it in one of the forms which says free order traversal. So can I say it's something like this, M is assigned, can I flatten it like this, okay, or can I take the second instruction and say R is assigned, okay, and so this now becomes like context free grammar and then whatever tree I had for a being assigned B plus C plus 9. That can also be traversed in a free order traversal and flattened. And then what do I do? Can I use YAC then to just match it? 
Is that pre pattern matching? Okay. So, pre pattern matching need not be only in this way, you can use even tools like YAC or Biasel to actually do code generation. Okay. So, once I have generated intermediate representation, I can write my machine instructions now like a grammar, a context free grammar, and then can do a pattern match using just the app and then get the code for this. And what is the action I write here? We already know the action I am going to write here is some bookkeeping for registers and generate some instruction end. Okay. I can write this kind of action and then the action by will be able to handle this situation. Okay. Only problem is going to be once again that different traversal orders and therefore different ways of flattening this particular T are going to give me different code sequences. Okay. So, for example, the code sequence we looked at for this intermediate representation, uh, which was this code sequence with these two errors instead of add, they should have been moved. Okay. I can take the same <coughs> machine instruction and can generate a different code sequence for that if I start doing my matching from the right hand side. Okay. So, suppose now I start matching my template from the right hand side and I say that this matches the template which says move a constant to register and then I generate this instruction which says move 9 to a register and the next pattern could be something like this, okay, where I actually match this whole thing and this is saying that now add this value into register R prime and R prime is now in this case R1 and then I can generate an instruction which says add R0 indirect C to R1, okay, that gives me C plus 9, okay, and then I can replace the whole thing by R1 and then the same pattern actually matches here and what I can do here is I can say that now this particular template matches this instruction template and what I can generate is add R0B to R1 and then this whole thing can be replaced by R1 and then this whole thing matches the template which is saying that move R into a location whose address is given by R prime indirect D and here D is constant A and what I can generate is move R1 to R0 indirectly, okay, and then this whole thing reduces to n. So instead of those seven eight instructions I generated, okay, I can just generate four instructions, okay, and I'm done. Okay. So traversal order is going to matter a lot here. Okay. And what immediately one has to think about is how do we address this issue of traversal order? Okay. So there are a lot of techniques people have done work on this, saying that irrespective of whether your operator is commutative or not, okay and how do you do pattern match and how do you really do something about reducing the traversal order and generate at least ensure that you generate one instruction sequence okay, which is set. Okay. So, there are a lot of research work which is available on this okay, and people have used different techniques. In fact, this is one of the pattern matching remains one of the most powerful techniques as far as code generation is concerned. Okay. So, many compilers actually instead of using three address code, do this kind of template matching and generate code. And you can see that this technique also is very amenable to retargetable code <coughs> generation because all I need to do is write these templates for a different machine. And once I have these templates for a different machine, then I can take the same intermediate representation, I can take the same code generation algorithm and then I can just traverse over this particular intermediate representation and then generate code by doing a pattern match with respect to a new machine template. So, you can do retargeting this code generation. So, this is where I want to stop on code generation okay, and want to move on to a new topic which obviously we will not be able to cover in detail. We just have about 20 minutes, but I will give you a glimpse at least into what happens in optimization. Okay. Because optimization is something which is fairly <coughs> formal stuff. Okay. So, let us look at something at least, I mean, you will get an idea of what optimization is all about. Okay. So, we talked about this problem called data flow analysis, right. I mean, I mentioned this term for data flow analysis, okay, and then we say that we do optimization, okay. Now, what is data flow analysis? First, let us look at conceptually, okay, then I can throw in some symbols and because without symbols, nothing works. <coughs> so, what we are trying to do is we are looking at a program and we are trying to find whether certain properties hold for this program irrespective of 
what is my input data and what is the path, what are the paths which are taken during execution phase of this particular program. So for example, if you recall, okay, in the previous one of the files, we had this debug hash being defined to zero. So I had this hash defined debug. <coughs> okay. And then I had this if debug. Now it doesn't matter which path is taken. If this variable is defined only once, then at all the places, irrespective of your input, at all the places, this debug can be replaced immediately by zero. Okay. Now how do I know this? Okay. I have to do certain analysis over the program to say that at the statement which says if debug then go to L2, there is the multiple paths which are reaching here, but doesn't matter which path you follow during execution, the value of debug which will reach here is always going to be zero. If I can assert that at compile time, then this property is independent of what happens at execution time. So what we do in data flow analysis is we try to find out certain properties of the program during compile time and see that whether these properties can be used now for program optimization. That is what data flow analysis is. Okay? So global optimizations, and remember that the only optimization we have done so far is looking at the local basic block and using the next use information and saying that <coughs> I can minimize my number of resources by looking at next use information. But suppose I want to go beyond basic blocks. Okay? Then I need to worry about multiple paths which may reach each of these basic blocks. Okay? So global optimizations are all based on what we know as data flow algorithms. And what these algorithms do, they gather certain data about the program and then what this data is going to tell us that we are looking for certain property that must hold every time this instruction gets executed. So this property must always hold. This property that debug will always be zero, this must always hold irrespective of how your program gets executed. Okay? And that is what data flow analysis will be able to tell me. And for different properties I want to compute, the analysis may differ. Okay? So let's look at one situation where I say that I want to do constant propagation. So constant propagation was where I said debug is defined, is initialized to zero, and then I was saying if debug, then sum. Okay. So what we want to do now is for constant propagation, we want to find out for every point in my program. Now what is point in a program? <coughs> point in a program is nothing but one of the basic blocks we constructed <coughs> and an instruction which is getting executed. Okay. So you remember the control flow graph I constructed of the program? by saying that I find headers, then I convert the break that pre instruction sequence into a set of basic block, and then I have control flow over it. Okay? So during execution, I'll be either before some instruction or either after some instruction. These are my program points. So if you recall, when I was doing this next use instruction computation, I had these instructions saying I2, I3, and so on. Okay? And I was doing computation of this property saying that at this point of time, at this point of time, whether the variable is live or dead. Okay. So this is the information I was computing. So now we say that for each point in the program and for each variable which is being used in the program, whether variable has a unique constant value at that point, and if this condition is true, if this property <coughs> is true, then I can replace variable reference by a constant value. Okay. So for example, if I can say that if I look at the basic block which contains this instruction, it says if debug and then do something and there are multiple paths which are coming into this basic block in my control program. If I can assert by analysis of this program that doesn't matter which path is taken, irrespective of that at this program point value of debug will always be zero. Okay? And when I say doesn't matter which path is taken, that means I must check this property on all the paths before I can do this assertion. Okay? If I can check that and this debug always turns out to be zero, then I can always replace this value by zero. Right? So this is what we do normally in constant propagation, that I check this property at every program point saying that look at all possible paths and find out what is the value of this debug and if it is a unique value which is the same, okay, then I can always do this replacement. Okay? Or another thing we saw was this live variable. Now live variable we were looking only within a basic block earlier. Okay, but suppose I have to do control flow. That means I must be able to check that if I go out on multiple paths from this, okay, whether this variable debug, so there is some variable which is available here, this is being used. Okay. Again, what I need to do here is that for every program point, I want to find out whether value of variable is sure to be overwritten before this is going to be read again. Okay. And if yes, then there is no need to preserve that value. 
Okay, so if I say that if I have a variable x here, and if I know that it doesn't matter which path I take, then this value is always going to be overwritten on one of these paths, on all of these paths before next use happens. Okay, then I know that whatever value has been assigned to x here is of no use. Okay, and I can then just remove it. Okay, so what I was doing in next use information was assuming that there is only one control flow path, and that was the basic property of a basic block saying you have a single entry and a single exit. But when I go into data flow analysis, I say there are multiple entries and multiple exits, and this property must now be checked for all possible paths, all combinations. Okay. Now you can see that immediately one problem that comes is when I talk about a closed form solution. The reason is there could be infinitely many paths. And also if you have a loop, I mean for example, if I say that there is a node where I enter the control, there is a node where I exit the control, and this is going to be unique for every program, then I can count number of paths in that, and this path may be, number of paths may be finite if I don't have a loop, but if I have a loop, I can have infinite paths, because I cannot assert anything about whether loop will terminate or not, okay? Now, what do I do? Do I exhaustively check this for all possible paths, or I can say, I can do some clubbing and say that if I check this property for some of the paths, then I can be sure about this property for all the paths. Right? Because somewhere you have to say that whatever form of your solution is, it is in closed form. I mean, I just cannot go on saying that I have infinite paths and I keep on checking it, this property for all possible paths. That's not doable. And even if I have a large number of paths, again, computationally it may be so costly that I may not be able to do that. Okay? So I have to do this kind of analysis. So again, uh, since I'm just giving you a glimpse of, into what happens here, let me skip some of these property materials and straight away come to some definition, okay, which will actually tell you something about that how do I model these solutions. Saying that although I have infinite paths, but I can talk only about finite properties over these paths. Okay. So what we say is that we define certain something called the reaching definition. So what I may do here is that suppose I have a control flow graph. And in this control flow graph, so this is what my control flow graph is, and this is a program point T, and this is some entry into control flow graph. Okay. Now I want to find out something like saying that there's a definition D. So what is my definition? If you recall, again, we gave definition like saying that if in general I have an instruction like this, which says X is being assigned Y of Z, this is given a name, this is an instruction I, or we call it a definition of X, we say that a definition D reaches a point P if there is a path from D to P and D is not killed on this path. That means this value is not overwritten. Suppose on this path, so I have at this program point definition D, which is defining, let's say, X, and here I want to say, is D reaching P? This is the question I want to ask. How do I know that this D will reach P? Now suppose there is only one path okay, from D to P, and on this path, I overwrite X. I say X is assigned, so I have, let's say this is D1, and this is D2, and I say X is assigned 7. Okay? Some arbitrary expression. Okay? Then will D1 ever reach P? Okay? D1 will never reach P because on this path, it is always going to be overwritten. So this is one set of information I collect when I'm trying to do data flow analysis. Whether I have a path from any definition to a point in the P program P. Okay? And there are formal methods of doing that. I mean, it's just not, you don't trace your program and then start doing this and collecting this information. Similarly, I may say that, what are the expressions which are available to me? Suppose I want to do common sub expression elimination. Okay? So suppose I'm saying that at this point, so now let me change my formalism and I say that A is assigned x plus y, okay? And suppose there are multiple paths coming here, okay? Can I now look for a property which will say that is x plus y always computed on all these paths? Because if I have, say, a computation of x plus y on this path, a computation of x plus y on this path, a computation of x plus y on this path, okay? Then I know for sure that doesn't matter which path comes here, x plus y has been computed. Now, it may not have the same value, okay? 
on this path it may have a different value on this path it may have a different value on this path it may have a different value but that doesn't bother us okay? as long as we know <coughs> that x plus y has been computed on all the paths okay then i know that i don't have to compute x plus y again so i can eliminate the second computation of x plus y because i know that irrespective of which path is taken during execution i will have some value of x plus y already computed with me okay so again i can do this kind of replacement and we say that an expression x of y is available at point p if every path to p evaluates this and after last such evaluation i do not make an assignment to either x or y because imagine that i am computing x plus y on this path okay and immediately after this i say that i am making an assignment to x now as soon as i make an assignment to x this x plus y becomes invalid because the value i will be computing here will not be this value but will be something else okay so again this is a property i can check by looking at my program okay another property may be i want to check whether a variable is live at a point p and we can say that if value of x can be used along some path yeah. oh so what may happen is that suppose i do this computation okay and i say that i want to reuse this computation and at run time suppose this path is taken okay then i cannot reuse this value because this value has already been changed by assignment to x right okay. but suppose this path was taken okay then i can use this value but i do not know at compile time which path will be taken this path could be taken or this path could be taken so i want to assert this property over all the paths okay so i should not have any assignment to either x or y on after last such computation okay but if you have an assignment then you must have one more computation for it similarly i can have something about live variable i can say a variable is live at some point p so i can say that if i have my control flow graph okay and i want to say is x live here at this point p okay then what will i say if it can be used along some path okay so suppose i have multiple paths going out here okay and if it is used on one of the paths okay then i know that this is surely live okay now you can see something very interesting in these three definitions first definition if you see this saying if something happens on one of the paths okay because there are multiple paths here so what what is happening here when you say reaching definition if there is a path from here and this is not killed okay now it is possible that on other paths okay i may not even have a definition of x okay but at least i know since i do not know which path is going to be taken here Okay. since i don't know which path is going to be taken here okay this path could be taken with equal probability as this path okay then i know that at least as far as this point is concerned there is a reaching definition okay but in this case i am asserting that something must happen on all the paths that if x plus y is available here then it must be computed on all the paths because if it is computed only on one of the paths okay and is not computed say on this path and actually control flows through this path at run time then i know that x plus y will not be available to me okay this has not been computed earlier okay so for this to be available here it must be computed on all the paths but for this to be reaching definition it is sufficient to say that it is available on one of the paths okay similarly when i say whether this variable is live i don't care about all the paths if i say this variable is live even if one of the paths uses it then i know that this variable is live okay so this is now what i am computing here is that suppose i say x is used on this path and i assert that x is live here but actually at run time this path is taken then i know that this x will never be used here but i am looking for certain properties which will always hold okay so i am looking at i am trying to simulate run time behavior at compile time okay and i am only interested in properties which will always hold which will not hold some of the time so i can do run time optimization but what i am trying to do first are compile time optimization and i am looking for certain properties which is always good okay so is is this clear i mean what are we doing here okay so let's look at i mean the kind of things which we do here okay so i may write something very interesting okay i may say that each basic block can generate a set of instructions each basic block can kill a set of instructions each basic block may receive so let's 
just write some basic law. So suppose I have a basic block like this, okay, in which I have two instructions. Let's say D1 is an instruction which says x is sine y plus 3. I have instruction D2, which is saying that y is a sine now z plus 2. And then I have D3, in which I say a is a sine b. Okay. Suppose I have these three instructions in a basic block. Now I know that when control comes in here, okay, and control goes out here. Okay. In a basic block, there is a single entry and single entry. Okay? What I know for sure is that irrespective of which paths which are taken, <coughs> at the end of this, suppose this, this basic block contains only these three instructions and nothing more. That at the end of this, I'll have a definition of x, which will be d1. I'll have a definition of y, which will be d2. And I'll have a definition of a, which will be d3. Okay? This is definitely sure that this basic block is going to generate three definitions, d1, d2, and d3. But it is also going to kill certain definitions. So for example, prior to this, suppose I had a basic block, okay, which let's say had d0, which was saying x is being assigned 7. Okay. Now I also know that if control flows through this, and since I don't know whether control will flow through this or not, I have to assume with equal probability, even if there is a path from here to here, okay, that if control flows from there, okay, then this d0 will not be available to me because x is being reassigned. So this definition will always be clear. So what I can do is, I can compute now set of definitions which are generated by a basic block. I can compute the set of definitions which are always going to be filled by a basic block. Okay? So for example, now I can say that if my universal set of definitions of x is dx, okay, then what are the definitions which are going to be filled by this basic block? of x, everything except d1. Okay? So it is going to kill all definitions which are dx in dx minus d1. Okay? So no matter how control flows, if any definition comes, that will get eliminated. And only a definition which will be available to me will be a definition d1. Okay? So I can compute now my sets of variables which are generated or sets of definitions which are generated and sets of definitions which are killed in a basic law. And then I can write equations like saying that the definitions which are coming in and what are the definitions which will come out. The definitions which will come out are either it is generated in the block or it comes into the block and is not killed. Okay, so I can write such equations for each basic block. So for example, for reaching definition, if I'm trying to say, I'm trying to compute my reaching definitions, then I can write an equation which will be of the form which will say that what comes out of a basic block is nothing but what gets generated here or what comes in and is not killed by this. Okay? And this equation is actually capturing my reaching definition, which are coming out of a basic one. So what we try to do is we try to assert these kind of properties over a program. And then using these properties, we try to optimize it over the program. Okay? So this is just to give you a glimpse into what actually happens in optimization. So optimization is a really very formal mathematical structure is not just template-based template pattern matching saying that do something, okay? because that something will never work or may not work. Okay? And you, what you do is you set up these kind of equations, and then you try to solve these equations. Okay? Now you can see that if I have one more equation, okay, one more equation could be that what is my inset? If I compute my inset, what will be inset? So inset in reaching definition could be that I take union of out of all the predecessors basic blocks, where p is predecessor of this. Right? So I can say that if my inset is, I just take union of all the outs, and my out is defined as whatever is generated union, what is coming in and is not here. Okay? And this way, for each basic block, I can set up these equations, and then I can solve these equations, which will tell me that what are the properties which always hold as far as this program. Okay. So let's close our discussion here today.